Hi, this is Kentucky Governor Matt Bevin. Thank you for tuning in. A number of you have uh, been waiting for this conversation to begin, as have I. A lot of information out there, some of it factual, some of it not. Say an hour, there's no hard stop time. If your questions drive us, it takes. This is your time. I'm grateful to the thousands of you that are already tuned in and others that will be tying in through Facebook Live. This is an incredible medium whereby you can reach out directly with questions. There are people in the room right next to where I'm sitting that will be going through those questions, but I also had sent out an email quite some time ago asking for your feedback even in advance. And so we'll start Look at uh, somebody by the name of uh, Corinne Ellis. This is an example of what's not helpful. You can fill in the blanks out of respect for Corinne. Uh, I'm going to be more gracious than was her response. This was from a pub, her public email address to my own. Courage uh, here in Kentucky. That can fact that that was the rare exception. More of it than there should have been, but 90% of you, I would say at least, were constructive, had thoughtful questions, thoughtful ideas, things you wanted to know. A good example of which was this one from Molly Johanneman. What is your step-by-step -step plan to fix the current pension deficiencies? How are you going to ensure that hardworking people with longevity are taken care of? This is the $64,000 question. How do we balance the obligations, the promises that have been made? There are three groups that we have to think about. Number one, the people that are already retired. They retired under the assumption that certain promises were going to be met. Those of you that are working right now have been working under the assumption that certain promises were going to be met. Those that are not yet employed have an expectation that when they enter employment that they understand how their ability to save for retirement and to have monies saved on their come to as a solution. But we are determined to work together to make this work. I have been in extended conversation with members in our House and our Senate and to a person, speaking for myself, but also speaking for them. We want to save the pension system. Simple as that. That's what we want to do. What we are not going to do in order to save it is to be knee-jerk reaction, to do things that are frankly uh, inappropriate in the short term to try to cut corners. There have been promises made. We are going to keep those promises. One of the things that we are not going to do is we're not going to take things from people that have already been earned. That includes people that are retired. That also includes people that are working right now. Even if it were legally allowed, it would be morally inappropriate. I will personally not sign such legislation. I don't believe from any conversation that I've had that our legislators, led by, led by Robert Stivers in the Senate and by Jeff Hoover in the House, that they want this. They don't want this. We want to deliver on the promise. There are a lot of rumors, a lot of concern, and for good reason, because this affects a lot of people's lives. Just today, the, PBG, or the uh, PFM came out with a report. They're a third-party consultant that was hired two years ago by the state. The legislature allocated money, saying we want somebody to look into this plan. Over the course of the last year, this group has been studying all of our pension plans in great detail. And in the course of studying these in great detail, they have decided that there are certain recommendations that they would provide to us. Those recommendations have been provided in several different reports. One of those reports came out today. I will say this right now without a crystal ball as to what will be the end result. I've had a chance to look at this report at a 30,000 foot level. And I will say this, there are good ideas in there. Some of them may be implemented. Frankly, I don't think there'll be an appetite for it. But those we got was this one. I'm a 26-year state employee in benefits. Would it be possible to use the money brought in for a crisis situation? 26 literally specifically as to whether we'll dedicate myself to make that but there is nothing 
ultimately are willing to look for funds that we could dedicate toward the if you're a pensioner already that you will have a check is in is that even what does that mean it's becoming bankrupt All we're in, in a year or two or five or ten, we won't. But if we stop digging, we have a chance to get out of the, of the hole. The, the plans that we will be coming up with will get us out over probably 20 to 30 years. I won't be anywhere near state government at that time, and chances are no one who represents you right now, the people that will be making the hard decisions, they'll be taking all the heat They'll be making the hard decisions now, but they're going to be doing it so that 20 and 30 years from now, and every year between now and then, the promises made continue to be kept. That's what we're committed to doing. We're not looking for short fixes, not looking for instant responses to problems that we're faced with. We're looking to fix this for the long term. One of the next questions, are higher taxes in the cards, this is from Evan Bohr, are higher taxes in the cards to help stabilize the pension system in Kentucky? Evan, I'll tell you, not if I can help it. Not if I can help it. I'm not a proponent of fixing problems that were created for whatever reasons. And there's a thousand ways in which people might anticipate what happened. I'm going to touch in a moment as to how we got to this problem. But truth be told, raising taxes on people today to fix problems that were made by folks in the past or false assumptions in terms of actuarial assumptions or numbers that were made in the past that's not the solution. It really isn't. We do need to modernize our tax structure. We do need, ultimately going forward, to make changes to our tax system. Doing it for the purpose of fixing this problem, not a good idea, not of course. So these two things are being separated for the time being so that we can address the pension system as it stands. The easy, expedient thing would be to just raise people's taxes, but there's a cost to that that frankly I think is untenable. And I think that is shared by the vast majority of folks in both the House and the Senate. Again, we'll have these conversations. We've been having these conversations. And I can tell you there's not a lot of appetite for raising taxes by the people that you've elected to represent you in Frankfurt. The next question is from Derek Jordan, who wants to know what about the teacher use them or lose them sick day issue? This isn't just for teachers but it's probably more topical with teachers than it is for some of our other employees. There's a policy, you know, use them or lose them kind of doesn't exist right now. People are allowed to accrue days, save them up. Uh, I, I don't know, I think, it, I think by uh, state law it's 10 that people get per year, 10 sick days, and certain local jurisdictions and school boards have given people even extra days, so depending on where you teach you may get, you know, 11 or 12 or I don't know how many. But usually 10 to 12 is about the number that most people get. The, the question at stake is, should we allow people who have not been sick or who can work through that sickness or who choose not to take a sick day, which incidentally, while I'm not a doctor, I advise to the extent possible as the father of nine kids who go to school, uh, being a sick teacher, uh, take the day off. You know, it might be advisable. I know it's hard and some people genuinely don't want to leave their kids without somebody. It's maybe hard to find a substitute teacher. But the fact of the matter is there's reasons why those sick days exist. Some people though have accrued an amazing number of them. Sometimes three digits worth of them, a hundred or even two hundred of them over a period of time, maybe even more. There is a policy now that allows people to use the value of those days and apply it toward their final year's salary. They take those upon retirement, they're calculated and added to their final year salary. That final year salary is something that's able to be included in a high three, for example, so the average of your last three and highest three years can then, in fact, be inflated, perhaps, or some would argue, artificially. Is that appropriate? Are those days there to spike a, a, a pension, to increase artificially a salary, or are they there for covering people that are sick? These are questions that are being had. We need to provide for those who take care of our kids, period. So if you are a teacher, you should have the ability, if you're sick, to be homesick. 
And I will say this again, this is going to be a decision made by the legislature, but from conversations I'm having with Speaker Hoover, President Stivers, and their various leadership, especially those addressing this pension problem, we do not have any intention of taking the value of things that are currently accrued away from people. We may change policies on a going forward basis, but the idea of going back in time and saying, hey, you should have used them, you should have retired, we're not going to play that game. I want to make something very clear. Nothing that we do, nothing that we do is going to come with an emergency clause, nothing. So you are not going to be forced if you're on the cusp of retirement or one or two or three months or years away, you're not going to be forced to make a quick knee-jerk response. We are going to protect the value of what you've earned to this point to the absolute extent of our ability, and I think that ability is high. We're also going to protect, for those of you that are close to retirement, some of you have already made decisions. You've perhaps bought a home in another place, or maybe you have children that have moved to be near you with a certain expectation that there is going to be a retirement sometime in the next two, three, four years for you, whatever the case might be. If, in fact, this is the case for you, you should not be alarmed that suddenly a wall is going to be erected and you're going to be trapped inside and have no choice. There will be no emergency clause. There will be no You're going to preserve the value of what you've earned for those who've earned it. The real crux of what we're wrestling with is how do we make changes that are fair to all concerned and affordable so that the system can be maintained going forward. And so the value of the promise that has been made is actually worth something. That's what we're going to be wrestling with as we talk about this in response to this latest PFM report. We have a question here uh, from Alex Shannara who asks, how do you plan to protect the first responders who work so hard daily? Is it possible to exempt us from benefit cuts or negative changes? Uh, in fairness, Alex, every state employee is asking the same question. I am a little bit biased toward those who do a job that, frankly, others don't want to do. Does that mean we can make exceptions for one group over another? I can't promise that. But I will say this, and I don't think there's many, if any, Kentuckians that would not agree. Just even earlier today, we had two state troopers that were attacked. One was stabbed in the head and in the arm. In response, he and his partner had to kill the person that was attacking them. This man was hospitalized, has been released, but suffered some pretty serious stab wounds. Most of us don't have to wrestle with things like this. Most of us don't go to work and worry about somebody attacking us because of the uniform we wear or the job that we're doing. Most of us have the luxury of being able to flee a dangerous situation. There are people that are paid with our tax money who go to work every day on our behalf to run into the face of those kind of dangers. Not just law enforcement officers, first responders of many kind. And to that end, I think we have a special obligation to people like that. What it looks like exactly, I can't definitively tell you right now. But can we protect to the absolute extent possible the promise made to those folks? You bet we can. And it's my commitment to you that we are going to try to do that. There is something to be said for folks that you asked about, Alex. And we are going to try to the extent possible to make as few changes on a going forward basis as we possibly can. The next question is from Chris Watkins, who asks, I am a CERS hazardous. You are aware that we do not pay into Social Security. In my 20-year career, I've paid zero, so I will not have these funds available. Will there be an early out of those in the system now? There's several different parts of that question I want to unpack. There are many employees in our state. An example is that that was just posed, but also a number of our teachers and people who work within our school systems who also don't get to participate in um, Social Security. That is a, a federal decision that was made. Will change. I think it would be advisable to allow people, everybody in Kentucky, to be able to participate in Social Security. But certainly, if that change was not made, we sure can't stick it to people like the, the uh, questioner Chris asks about. It would be absolutely wrong to send a person who was never allowed to save for Social Security, who's not eligible to draw down Social Security, and send them out there with no backstop from the state and say, hey, good luck to you. We're not going to do that. That's just morally wrong. Even if it were legally allowed, it's morally wrong. Who would want that done to us? I wouldn't. I don't imagine any other person with a straight face would like it done to themselves. 
And so we're going to take care of our fellow Kentuckians because that's the way we do things in this state. I will say this. We've got to make sure that people recognize this is a big problem for some employees. For example, we have teachers who, because they couldn't participate in Social Security, they're not even allowed to draw Social Security benefits from a spouse. So they may have a, a spouse who passes away, somebody for whom they might have been able to receive some of the value of their Social Security benefit that was earned during that individual's career. But a teacher in Kentucky, for example, or one of these uh, hazardous uh, duty employees that Chris alluded to, they don't have that luxury. They literally are not able to get any benefit. And so we have to balance that as well. This isn't lost on me. It's not lost on our legislature. We're going to make sure that we do right by people. And I appreciate that question. Do know that we wrestle with this question and we're going to make sure that we do right by you. The next question is Don Marie uh, Choir Wise who asks or says, I'm extremely concerned. My husband is already retired. Does this mean he will lose his retirement? No, no, not a chance. In fact, it is literally for people like your husband that is causing us to address this right now. Anyone who is retired right now, and again, this decision is gonna be made by the legislature, working with my administration, they'll do the work of crafting this legislation and I will sign ultimately into law what we must do to save the pension system. But I feel very confident speaking for the end result of what we're gonna do, and that is to not take a pension, not gonna happen. I will not sign such a bill. I have not had a conversation with a single legislator who is, a, who is proposing a bill like that. So if you're concerned about your uh, pension, do not be. I want to address something else that actually was brought up to me earlier today in a conversation. It's not a question up here. It may come in. Maybe you've asked this question, and if it shows up, uh, I'll just address it now in advance because I don't want to forget about it. One of the other things I heard recently from somebody who's in law enforcement is that one of the rumors that's been running around is that if you don't retire now, you lose all your health benefits and your health coverage. Nonsense. That will not happen. That is also not proposed by me or anyone that I've spoken to about this issue. We are fighting to preserve for people, not take from people, the things that they expect. And for people in terms of when they retire to when they're eligible to get Medicare, for example, there are gaps that I would be very concerned if I thought I couldn't have health coverage during that time. If I would be concerned and I'm trying to treat people the way I want to be treated, I'm going to put myself in that person's shoes and as governor of this state, and I know our legislators feel the same way. I mean, I've personally talked with Jeff Hoover and, and Robert Stivers and their teams about this, and we want to make sure that people don't have reason to be financially afraid. We are going to save this pension system, and your husband should have no concern, nor should you, about losing the pension benefits that he has accrued thus far. Laura Glass. If changes are made, when will they go into effect? That's a good question. Bottom line is, there will not be an emergency clause. This will probably go into effect, let's say we have the special session this fall, which we will. Let's say we come to conclusion about what must be done, and I believe that we will. I don't see this going into effect until top of the year, maybe, at the earliest. I, I would be remiss to try to pick the date. Maybe we wait till the end of the fiscal year, which is June 30th. There's been no determination on that yet. What The only thing I can guarantee you is that it will not go into effect immediately. That I can promise you. As to when it goes into effect, it'll be some weeks and months and or quarters down the road from when the final determination is made. People will have ample opportunity to thoughtfully look at what has been done. And I will say this again, I don't want to overpromise or speak for the legislature. But we are also trying to preserve this same capability, as I said earlier, to those that are within a few years of retirement. We don't want to force you to make a knee-jerk reaction and then retire and wish you hadn't two and three months down the road when you realize that you didn't need to. If you have the kind of experience that allows you to be able to be retired, chances are you're a valuable asset to this state and we'd like to keep you. But I want you to be able to make that decision for yourself and not have me or anyone in state government make that decision for you. The time will be made available to you to make that thoughtful decision. 
The next question is from Braden Lacefield, who wants to know why can't the county employee pension system keep their current system as it is much more well kept than the state system? This is referring to CERS, which is right now sort of a part of KERS. KERS, everyone knows, is the KERS non-hazardous plan is the worst funded of all the plans. But even that county plan is well under 60% funded. It's some 50 some odd percent funded. The KERS non-hazardous plan, the worst one of all, that's somewhere between 9 and 16% funding depending on what assumptions you use, that one itself was 50 something percent funded just as recently as 2009. The biggest issue, and I haven't touched on this yet, and it's worth it, if you bear with me, let me explain one thing. There's a lot of people upset as to how we got here. What caused this problem? Who didn't do what? Who didn't fund what? Who took money from where? The reality is this. There was not anything overly nefarious done on the part, things done on the part of people. What was done was two things. Number one, a use of bogus numbers. And shame on our actuaries for having perpetuated this idea that payroll growth was increasing when in fact everyone knew that it was decreasing. Payroll has not been going up in state government for more than a decade. It's been going down. And we've been assuming that it's going up, which was a false assumption. We've also been assuming that we're getting rates of return with our investments in the market. So those two things, assuming the people paying into the system, those two things I would dare to say probably wanted to be lured into that. Because by being lured into that false assumption, it meant what? It meant we had to put less money in. If the problem's not so big, we don't have to put in so much money. And so the actuaries and the people who were making the decisions on the KERS board, the vast majority of whom have been replaced with competent people, were basically making assumptions that were faulty. And we had an accountant and an actuary that was Frankly, I believe criminally negligent with respect to the responsibility they had to bring good information. And they allowed this perpetuation of misinformation to continue. But I will say this, even if we had put in all of the right numbers according to the actual ARC, and many of you know what the ARC is. It's the actuarially required contribution is one of the the uses of one of the ways that acronym is explained. It's essentially what is required based on what the actuaries are saying that should be put in to make sure that the pension does not become less well-funded. In other words, it doesn't get us back to full-funded status, but it doesn't make the problem worse. If we were to put that amount in every year, it basically keeps you steady. That's the argument. We have, in the previous administration, one time in eight years, did they actually put in the actuarially required a contribution. That's the unfortunate part. They just didn't meet the ARC. They met what was required statutorily. You can't, you, many people say, well, it's our legislators did this and our legislators did that. The legislators did what was required of them to do. Straight up, they did. People may not like what was required of them, but they did what was legally required of them. The ARC was something that is suggested that they go back, and yet often people did not go back and make that contribution. It's neither here nor there. I mean, we can blame people, but the fact is it wasn't done. However, if it had been done, if every single time the ARC was proposed, the ARC was paid, we still would have only fit, of the, of the underfunded status that we have, only 16%, one six percent of it, 16% would have actually been accounted for by making the ARC. So instead of being 100% of the hole we're in, we'd have been in a hole that was 84% of the size. People say, how is that possible? I thought if we made the arc, there would be no hole. What we did not take into consideration is demographics. And by demographics, it's a big word that not all of us use every day, including myself, but this is what it means in a nutshell. When these pension plans were set up, you had seven, eight, nine employees for every retiree. It was like this, it was a pyramid. The employee that was retired was at the top. And there were five, six, seven, eight, nine people at the bottom. And then as time went by and baby boomers began to retire and fewer people came into the system, there were four, five, six, and then three, four, five, and then two, three, one, and then two, and then one and a half, 
And we literally have systems now where you have individuals, you may have less than one person per retiree in some of our plans, even among teachers, which is one of the more well-funded plans, even though it's severely underfunded at 50 some odd percent. There's less than one and a half active teachers right now in Kentucky for every retiree. How can a teacher who's making $40,000 a year own retirement and pay a benefit to another teacher who's retired who may be making $40,000 a year in retirement? How is that possible? Mathematically, it's impossible. Where we in Kentucky went wrong, previous administrations who kept kicking this can and kicking this can and kicking this can down the road, where did they go wrong? Where did our actuaries drop the ball by not sounding the alarm? By recognizing the fact that an aging population and more people retiring than coming in was creating a cliff that we were not going to survive if we didn't address. That's the problem. So even if we'd met every arc that was ever suggested, we'd still be in a hole 84% the size of the hole we're in right now. Would it be better than a 100% hole? Of course but it would still be a crisis, and that's why we're addressing this situation. The next question comes from Paula setzer Kissick, who wants to know, over 40% of current teachers can retire this very today. How does that help the pension system if everyone chooses to leave? It, it wouldn't help the pension system, but it doesn't frankly hurt the pension system necessarily either. It really doesn't. The problem is the, the, the problem still exists. It was interesting to me I saw recently that there have been these kind of posts put out there essentially threatening that all these people could retire. 13,400 teachers could retire today if they were so inclined. I don't assume that this is intended to be a threat to people, but for so little of their responsibility that they're responsible to that they would literally create an environment where that's not even a temptation. There's really no advantage to doing that. I could tell you right now, we're not going to pass anything that will cause a person to wish they had retired earlier as a result of it. We're just not going to do it. Why cut off our nose to spite our face? But I will say this, if you happen to be a teacher who would walk out on your classroom in order to serve what's in your own personal best interest at the expense of your children, you probably should retire. I'm being completely serious. If that's truly where you are at this stage in your career, I wouldn't suggest that being in the classroom is probably the best use of your time. And yet I know for a fact that watching this don't think that way. Certainly thinking about even my own children's teachers, I'm grateful to those teachers for whom this is a true calling and a true passion. Thank you for that. There's literally no amount of money we could pay you to keep up with all of our kids day in and day out. And I personally thank you for that. And I know this isn't a temptation for you. But I want to make sure that there's no reason for it to be for anyone based on the decisions that we make. There's a question here from Gretchen Marshall who writes, public employees take lower salaries than what they could make in the private sector in exchange for pension benefits. If pension benefits are reduced, will the state be looking to equalize state salaries with their counterparts in the private sector? Certainly that would be a possibility. I would say this to anybody in the private sector or public sector. Go where you can be best compensated for the value you bring to the equation. I'm grateful for the fact that many people do work in government because they want to help their fellow citizens. And I'm grateful that should be, public service should be exactly that, serving the public. Not, is, not what's in it for ourselves individually. But I will say this, I would like to see fewer people working in state government and them making more money. I don't want us to have to settle for people who can't make as much in the outside. We have many people in state government who could make as much or more in the outside world. But I'll tell you what, I want them to be able to make as much in state government as we have the ability to pay them. I don't want it to be such a sacrifice that we have to compromise on the quality of applicants or the number of applicants. And so I appreciate that question, I really do. I'd like to see government doing as few things as possible, doing them as well as possible, and paying people as much as possible in order to get that job done. We have a question, or, uh, question here from Derek Bonifer who says, do you support pension obligation bonds as part of the solution? One of the issues we have to understand, and this is a pension obligation bond, is, is the state would issue a bond that would require the taxpayers of the future to pay it off in order to put monies 
if in fact it is, that's been proposed in the past, that we would borrow money, that we would bond it, that we would use that money to shore up the pension system. But truth be told, we couldn't even begin as a state to borrow the kind of money needed to actually fully fund our pension system. We really don't have the credit worthiness. We have actually in recent years and even in recent months been downgraded. There are several major rating agencies. You've heard of them, S&P, Moody's, Fitch's. These are people who look at different organizations, different states, whatever the case might be, people who issue bonds, different corporations. One of those entities that could issue a bond to the question we were just asked would be the state of Kentucky. But frankly, our credit rating has been downgraded and downgraded and downgraded. We're at the bottom end of investment grade and that's starting to push the envelope. We run the very real risk of being downgraded to junk status. If we were downgraded to junk status, then our ability to even borrow money at rates that we could afford to pay back are very limited. We also have a certain borrowing threshold. And what I mean by that, a threshold at which people believe we'll pay them back. We have a fair amount of debt already in this state. We're already paying off a lot of bonds. Some for very good things, some maybe more questionable, but the bottom line is they're still there. We still have an obligation to pay them. We still are expected to pay them back. And at a certain point, if we issue too many bonds, if we take on too much debt, then we have to pay such interest to get somebody to buy that that it becomes counterproductive. So I don't think the solution is to borrow money. Frankly, it is not possible for us to borrow 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 billion dollars. Nobody would lend us that money. Nobody would be confident that we could pay it back. So how much can we borrow? If we make concrete decisions, the kind that will get us over 20 and 30 years back to par, the credit rating agencies will take note. Our credit worthiness will rise, our ability to borrow will rise, our cost of borrowing will go down, and all of that helps us slowly but surely, step at a time, get out of the hole we're in. That's how we're going to do it. It's not going to happen overnight. We didn't get here overnight. We're not going to fix it overnight. Here's a question from Paul Rister. What retirement benefits are covered by the inviolable contract under the KERS? And this is, I guess, referring to KERS, uh, probably hazardous and non-hazardous. The inviolable contract is a term that's used by many people and nobody, let's be completely honest, fully knows exactly what it means. And I can be confident in saying that because it's never been fully vetted. What I can tell you, I have no intention of violating anything that is contractually obligated of us. So why would we do that? It will be contested in court and should be. If people are doing something illegal, they should be held to account. I know that our legislature is not proposing this. I'm not proposing this. But truth be told, we don't know what this is as it relates to that contract. So let's figure it out. Let's get wise heads looking at it. I think everybody agrees certain things are absolutely untouchable. Others may be touchable and others are definitely touchable. I mean, let's go at it that way. Let's be thoughtful about what we can or can't do. Here's what I can promise you. We're not taking anything from people that have already been earned. In other words, if you've accrued you know, days of this, that, or the other thing, you've accrued benefits toward retirement, you've worked 26 years, as was noted by somebody earlier, we're not gonna take the value of that away from you. There was a promise made to you, you're gonna get that. To the absolute extent of our ability to give it to you, and I believe that ability is high, you are going to get what you've earned thus far. The real question is, what happens from this point forward? What affects the person who's not even an employee yet, or somebody who is not yet at that retirement point? That's where the differences are gonna come into place. Taking things back from people, not gonna happen. Changing the game and pulling the rug out from somebody who's a few years away from retirement, not gonna happen. There's no value in doing that. It creates more trouble for Kentucky than it solves. And even the credit rating agencies, I don't think would appreciate a state making that kind of mayhem, so we don't intend to do it. There's a question here from Melissa Grant. I enjoy being a public servant, however, when I work my tail off for what little I make and the minimal health benefits I get, all while handling government entitlements to able-bodied people who refuse to work, very disheartening. I'll tell you, Melissa, I, 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 you're not alone. I hear this increasingly. We have over 200,000, maybe 225,000 or so, able-bodied working age men and women in Kentucky who have no dependents, who choose not to work who fit the bill of what you're saying. 
Some for really no reason other than the fact that it's a lifestyle choice. That is going to change of necessity. It isn't fair to you, Melissa, it isn't fair to anyone else in the public sector or the private sector to be funding an able-bodied person who chooses not to work. The value of not working in Kentucky right now is too high. It just is. Does that mean we don't want a safety net? Of course not. We have programs, entitlement programs as they were referred to, that were intended to help those who need help. The blind, the frail, the elderly, those that are truly sick, pregnant women, children, people who need the help of society. That's what those programs are for. That's who I intend to preserve them for. If somebody's like me and they're able to work and they're of working age and they don't have obligations to keep them at home, they should go to work, period. And Kentucky's moving very quickly in a direction where that's going to be expected. So if you're a person who chooses not to work, that day of uh, responsibility is going to be coming. So start to anticipate that. Because to the militias inside state government and the militias outside of state government, we owe it to them who work and bust their tails, as was noted, to provide for everything we take value in and appreciate in Kentucky, and in America for that matter. We owe it to them to make sure that it's not wasted. And I intend to be a governor in a state where we don't waste the hard efforts of people like Melissa. The next question is from Caleb Young. Um, and I'm moving my chair now because, you know, at my age, uh, it starts to hurt sitting on a wooden stool. Caleb Young, how much will special session cost? Why can't it be done during the regular session? Will they work for free? What they should be doing already? In fairness, Caleb, I don't know that it's fair uh, to, to be on misunderstanding the last part of your question, but we should not expect them to work for free. And whether they're here in a regular session or not, uh, they are getting paid. It does cost extra money to the first part of your question, and it's a good question. I don't know the exact number, but I think it's about sixty to $65,000 a day. So assume a special session, which is a week, because you need five days in order to have a special session where you can have the proper readings, have the people uh, in the right uh, conversation. People would come in and testify for, or against, what have you. Debates would be had. You'd have a first reading, a second reading. Ultimately, there would be a vote. You need five days in order to get this done. So that five days would cost the taxpayers of Kentucky $300,000, $350,000 roughly. That's a lot of money, understood. But trust me, compared to the scores of billions, the tens upon tens upon tens of billions of unfunded liability, and the impact it would have on people of allowing that system to fail, $300,000 is worth it. It is. I'm very fiscally prudent. I wear this button because I want to cut red tape. I want to cut bureaucracy. I want to cut waste. I grew up in poverty myself financially, and I'm grateful for the fact that America affords people a better alternative. But one of the things about growing up poor is you value a buck, and I value a buck, and I still spend my money very frugally. As governor, I spend your money very frugally. I would not call a special session if I thought that it wasn't worth it. This is overdue. It is worth it. The ability for us to focus only on this, to have no excuses or distraction, is critical. We've got to be able to focus on the task at hand, and that's what we're going to do. The next question is from Jeremy Waters. You have touched on teachers, state police, and county workers. Now what about state corrections? We are in such a crisis already. Do you think that modifying the retirement further will be the final nail in the coffin? No, I mean, what, I, I hope it's clear that thus far, while I've specifically mentioned certain groups, there are, of course, social workers, there's correction workers, there's highway workers, there's a lot of folks that maybe I've not specifically mentioned, but that's who we're talking about. There's nobody that we're looking to leave out of this conversation. Being a corrections officer is a thankless task. That is also a brutally hard job and a thankless job at times because, frankly, it doesn't pay much. For those of you that are out there doing this, thank you for that. Truly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I've been inside our prisons. I've met with a number of you. I know how hard you work. I know how dangerous the job can be. It is my intent to make sure we take care of you. I'm not going to change things. If you notice, for corrections workers, since I was elected, we've actually increased pay fairly significantly. Is it still arguably too low by many standards? Yeah, it is. And I wish we could do more for you and for every other state worker. But where we have been able to, we've made increases and we've done it in acknowledgement of the point that you've said it is in crisis. And we're trying to make it more easy, not just for you, but for your families as well. 
There's a lot of concern for the family of corrections workers, just like so many of our other frontline responders. So I intend to save the system for you as well, to make it easier for you to go to work with a sense of comfort that you're going to get what's worth it for you to show up at work, including your retirement benefits. My job is to save those for you. That's the job of our legislature. That's what we're working to do. We want to save the pension systems. Simple as that for every single worker in the state of Kentucky. The next question is Tanya Howard Warren, who asks, why don't you just give teachers the option to also pay into Social Security like most states? If teachers pay into retirement and Social Security, we could receive both benefits like most other states do for their teachers. Amen. You're absolutely right. And that is my intent to do everything we can to make that possible on a going forward basis to allow teachers to be able to pay in. But we can't stick it to those who haven't been able to. Let's say you're a teacher who's retired already. You'll never be able to draw on Social Security because of decisions that were previously made. So if we switch to this and expect, well, then that's what they can do. Well, they, certain people can't take any benefit. Let's say you're a teacher who's teaching right now and you've been in for 25 years and you could retire in the next two, three, four, five years. Well, truth be told, you could retire. Let's say we switch to Social Security for teachers tomorrow. Let's just say we did that. Well, heck, the best you're going to get is two, three, four, five years of paying in before you're eligible to retire. Guess what? The first 25 years you worked, you'd get no benefit for that. The federal government's not going to give you credit. Well, we sure better be mindful of that. It wouldn't be fair of me to stick it to you or for our legislature to stick it to you, so we're not going to do that. We are literally going to look at what the impact is on the individual basis of each person. Obviously, not looking at every single person who earned a benefit, get that benefit. As a result, going forward than any value we the state have to that individual whatever the case might be we owe it to you I heard you say things wouldn't save for change things for retired employees what about state employees already in the system I think the question is you know and again this is I'm glad it's not just me uh, that does this it's hard sometimes when you're typing something out there an extra word gets in there or a word doesn't come out or whatever the case might be I think the question is, if, if we're not going to change things for those retired, what about the people already working? That's a great question. I think we've addressed that, but let me hit it again for those who might have just dialed in. For the people that have earned something to this point, you're going to get what you earned, period. It's the right thing to do. Legally, it's, I believe, a requirement in many instances. Certainly morally, it's a requirement. It's inappropriate to change the rules on you after you've already agree, agreed to, to enter into the game. And that some of you have 20, 30 years into a system, you ought to get what you thought you had coming to you. So I intend to preserve to the best of my ability, and I know that our House and Senate intend the same, that we are going to preserve the promise to the retirees and to those of you that are working right now. That's an obligation that you expect. It's one that we owe you. There's a question here from Melissa Mullins. Why were funds taken from KTRS for other needs in state government? Has it all been paid back? There's a lot of urban myth associated with monies that have been taken from programs in the past. The bigger issue is what was not put in that arguably could have been or should have been. Truth be told, I've only been in Frankfurt for 18 months. I'm not an expert on exactly what happened in years past under the previous administrations. I will say this, the plans are underfunded. However it got that way, monies were not taken out as much as they were not put in as much as people didn't recognize what was happening with the aging and retiring population relative to the people coming in. Monies have been put back. No administration in the history of this state has ever put more money into the pension system than my administration did last year. We put $1.2 billion into the pension system. We cut 9% out of everything that we could cut in state government in order to make that possible. That was to prove to you that I was serious when I say that we are going to start to address this situation. And yet I heard people say, well, we put $1.2 billion in. Good, we fixed that. We plugged that hole. We didn't even come close. I wish we did. But here's something I want you to understand. If we don't fix this pension system, it's going to cost us a whole lot more cuts than this. If we don't fix this system, if we allow it to continue to build and this obligation to grow with no acknowledgement of the hole that we're in, then the 9% change that we made two years ago or last year 
The next budget session next year, we would have to cut 34% out of the same categories. That's from the floor we're at now. We don't get the 9% back and start over. That's from the reduced floor where we are. We would have to cut 34%. Think about that. Who would want 34% of state government cut in a single two-year period? And let's say, well, people say, well, we got to cut more things. Let's say you spread it across all of state government, and I mean everything, from education, seek, higher education, law enforcement, now, veterans, Medicaid, you name it, everything. If you cut everything in the state that we have the ability to cut, that we're not prevented from cutting by federal mandate, it would still be almost 15%, about 14.8, 14.9%. Who wants to do that? I don't. Our legislature doesn't. You don't. Truth be told, some of you are going, yeah, we should do that. Really? Do you really want 15% less educating your children? 15% less protecting you in your safety? 15% less fixing roads and repairing bridges? Is this what we want? It's not what we want. This is why we're making these hard decisions now. It's not fun. It's not easy. I will tell you this. I hope that for most of you, you have better appreciation for your elected Whether you do this or not, I'll leave to your determination. But I would ask you to encourage them Write them a note of thanks and appreciation because truthfully, the men and women that represent you now in Frankfurt, they're cleaning up mess made by a lot of people that preceded them. And they're doing this because they care about you. They are gonna earn the small amount of money that they are paid. And trust me, legislators don't make nearly what people propose that they do. And another thing I want to address, it hasn't come up in a question, I'm surprised because I've heard it a lot. People say, well, these legislators, you know, they, these legislators, they've got these big fat pensions and theirs is fully funded. No, it's not. Theirs is also failing. Their pension system is also in dire straits. Is it arguably more well funded than some of the others? Yeah, but they're all in terrible shape. And again, without speaking for our legislators, I know from conversation that I've had with them that they're going to lead by example. You mark my words. They will lead by example. There is nothing that will be proposed on a going forward basis, nothing that we are going to propose to any of our pension systems that our legislators will not expect of themselves and will not do by example. They're going to lead by example. They will insist on it. I will insist on it. You deserve it. That's the way it should work. The next question is from Tommy Williams. Why do government employees get a cushy pension when the rest of us have to work till we are 70? I, I do want to correct one thing. I kind of touched on it a moment ago. Most people don't get a cushy pension. Some do. Some get varying degrees of cush. Some have played the system. Just recently, literally, there was an individual who retired at 41 years of age and will earn about $80,000 a year in retirement for the rest of their life with, with full health care benefits. I, truth be told, I won't go into specifics, but this person doesn't deserve that money. And many of you are paying for that. Most of you don't get anything close to that. A lot of you are saying, how is that possible? I can't get that. You're right, you can't. The average person in KERS non-hazardous, which is the worst funded plan of them all and covers the most retired people in Kentucky of them all, the average annual benefit is less than $21,000 a year. Total, gross, $21,000. That's not huge. And so I do want to correct that. It's a fair question because there's a lot of rumor out there about how fat everyone's getting. Some really are, and that shouldn't be allowed. But for the average worker out there, they're busting their hump and they're not getting a ton in exchange. But they are getting something that they can afford to live on. And even if it is just a couple thousand dollars a month or even a little bit less on average, that's a couple thousand dollars a month that they need. And that's an obligation that we have to them for the work that they've given. The next question is from Shannon Coyle. Governor Bevan, are you working with KEA as you contemplate these changes for KTRS? Yes. I've had extensive meetings with a whole lot of groups, including KEA. I won't single them all out other than this one simply because the question was asked. I've had good conversation, good thoughtful dialogue. Do we agree on everything? No. Have we in the past? No. Are we like to, likely to agree on everything in the future? Respectful, adult-like conversation, recognizing that we have a mutually uh, a, a desired outcome, which is to fulfill the promises made, that's a good thing. And I'm grateful, truly grateful, for the hours of time that I've been able to spend with members of a lot of different organizations, 
not only the membership of those organizations, but the leadership of those organizations. So thank you to those of you who have given me your time. There'll be more expected and asked of you. If you have ideas and things you want us to know, reach out to my office. Reach out to my budget director, John Chilton. Reach out to your local representative. Let them know what you would have them hear. That's the purpose of this conversation as well. Uh, Carrie Cotu has asked, what are, your, what are you planning for retirees who have returned to work as contractors, or more importantly, state employees earning second retirements. The opportunity to work in, in double dip or triple dip, as it was called, that has been ended. No longer are people allowed to start careers in government where they can earn a second retirement. That was ended in recent years. But there was some of that that went on. It should not have been allowed to. This was another thing that contributed to this unfunded status that we have. There are many people, however, who retire and then go back to uh, earning uh, a, a salary, maybe as much or more as a contractor, maybe even in the same area that they were just working in as an employee. Is that uh, legal? Sure, it's legal. Is it appropriate? Maybe. Is it arguably not? Is it perhaps compound that we need? But we shouldn't have an, a system incentivizes a person to retire from state government because they can make more than doing the same job as a contractor while getting a full pension from those of you that are still working. Whether you're in government or outside of government, people being retired in their 40s and even in their 50s is something that frankly isn't an option for people out in the private sector. So we have an obligation to honor the pension uh, promise. We do, and we're going to do it. But the bottom line is we have to look at all these things around the edges that are perhaps contributing to why we've gotten into this situation and what is or is not allowed. So these are all these things are being discussed and will continue to be discussed going forward. From Max Hall wants to know why wouldn't you do the tax reform first, then do the pension system and know exactly how much money you can accumulate from that, then have proposals for the state workers. I like the logic of this in some measure, but I've literally uh, I believe it's even best when flipped around. I'd rather know what the whole is. How big is the obligation? So that when we do get to pension or tax reform, to the extent that it is necessary to raise revenue somehow, then we would have that knowledge in advance. But as I said earlier, and I want to repeat this, I do not intend to sign legislation that would raise taxes to pay for the pension problem. That's not the solution. You don't stick it to our kids and our grandkids for a problem that the people that preceded us made. That's, that's irresponsible. It's wrong, frankly. Who'd want to do that to their kid? I don't. So to that end, we're going to fix the pension problem as a standalone problem to the absolute extent of our ability. I use that term intentionally and I've used it multiple times. There are things we can do legally and there's things that we can do financially and we're going to do every one of those that we can do, period. And so that's what we're going to do as a standalone. Tax reform is coming, mark my words. We exempt more money than we take in in the state. If we simply aligned our tax structure with that of the federal government, that would generate significant money without really putting anybody out. People are used to it at the federal level. We as a state could modernize our system tremendously. I bet we'll probably be having a conversation like this at some point down the road to talk about exactly that. The next question is from Brandon Godby, who asks, how do we design a pension system that is, both fifth, that is both fiscally responsible and attractive enough to lure our best and brightest citizens into jobs that often require personal sacrifice and an expensive education? That seems to be the $10,000 question. Brandon, I think you're underestimating the value of that question. It is. That's perhaps the $10 billion question. That's really what we're talking about. That is the purpose of this entire conversation. That is the purpose of our meetings with the legislature and my administration. This is what we're wrestling with. As I've said before, there's three promises we have to make. One to our retirees, one to the people currently working, and one to the people who have yet to come. And those are the ones you're talking about. The people for whom we need to make something attractive enough for them to make it worth their while, for it to be worth their while to come to work. That's what I am determined to do. The bottom line is this, young people today, those that are just entering the workforce, they want control, they want freedom, they want flexibility. And these are the kind of things that we also have to be think, thinking about. Most people no longer enter into careers where they do the same thing for 20 or 30 years with no change. And so we have to think about that. Does that mean we don't continue to offer that to people? 
we'll determine that. But I'll tell you, I think a lot of people like the idea of having more flexibility and control and being able to move from job to job and not being stuck on a single track. And so that's one of the things that actually makes it more attractive to people. If we can develop a program and a system that actually gives people the freedom, the flexibility, and the financial mobility that they're looking for, I think that's what we're seeking. And that's what we're going to be doing as we develop this going forward. The next question is from Rusty Back, who asks, is the consultant's report what is likely to happen or will adjustments be made, but not necessarily the off-the-cliff suggestions in the report? Uh, it, it is, I can say without, I mean, again, I don't answer for everybody else who's going to read this report and work with me to come up with a solution. Just from my initial analysis of it, it is not going to be exactly what happens. It, it just, it's just not, period. They were tasked with the following. They, the consultants, and they did a good job, and I'm grateful to PFM for doing it. They were tasked with coming up with suggestions that were the right financial decisions to make. They didn't take into consideration all the personal capital or the political capital or the emotional capital or all the other thing. That wasn't their job. Their job was to look at it from a pure dollars and cents, black and white, standalone standpoint. And that's what they've done. So the fact that they've looked at this from that standpoint is why, in fact, we have something that seems at first blush to be perhaps a little bit harsh. And so we are not going to take it hook, line, and sinker. The fact is, they don't vote. They, the consultants, don't have the ability to decide what happens. That's where your legislature comes into place. That's where I and my administration, my budget director, and the people in my finance cabinet come into place. This is what we have to do. This is our job. We are going to fix this pension system. We're going to save this pension system. It's my promise to you. I'm going to do everything in my power. I will close with this. There has never in the history of America been a pension system as severely underfunded as ours is now. I wish that wasn't the case, but there's no one that I can turn to, literally no one anywhere that I can say, we're going to do it like they did in this state or in this city or in this county or in this anywhere. It's never been done. We are trying to do something that is not unique to Kentucky, however. In America, there are four to five trillion, somewhere between four and five trillion dollars. And as a reminder, for those of us like myself who've been out of school for a while, a trillion is a thousand billions. There's four to five thousand billion dollars worth of unfunded pension obligation in America today. So frankly, everyone's looking for a solution on this. States don't have the luxury of declaring bankruptcy. And yet we in Kentucky could sell every single thing we own, every state park, every building, every you know, school building that the state has dibs on, every public building, every pencil, every car, everything. It wouldn't even come close to meeting the obligation we have to our retirees. This is why we have structural change that has to be made. But I'll tell you this, I'm encouraged by our legislature. I'm grateful to Robert Stivers. He's been in the Senate with his colleagues for years, pounding the table on this, as were people who preceded him. This has been something that has been a topic of conversation for a long time. And some of those in the Senate have been like the lone sentinel in the wilderness, calling for someone to pay attention to this. Well, the day has come that we're paying attention. Robert Stivers now has Jeff Hoover in the House as the Speaker of the House. This has been ignored by the House for year after year after year after year. It shouldn't have been, but it was. Jeff Hoover and Robert Stivers and their teams are determined to save the pension system. Simple as that. So am I. The fact that we're in agreement gives me great encouragement. It gives me confidence that when I say to you, we're going to work to save this system, that even though it never has been done anywhere, even though we don't have a model to follow, that we're laying down footsteps that the entire rest of the country is looking at. Because what we do here to save our system will be the model that others will follow. And we're going to follow these footsteps that we're going to have to lay down for ourselves. And we're going to do this over the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years, and we're going to get ourselves back to solvency. We're going to fulfill the promises to our retirees, to our current workers, and to those that are yet to come. And we're going to do this because we are Kentucky. Thank you for tuning in and stay tuned for the things that we're going to propose in the weeks ahead. God bless you.